Well, good morning again. <laughs> if we've not met, my name is Mark. I'm the lead pastor, and we are in a series in the book of Acts titled To the Ends of the Earth. And I just want to say before I jump in that wasn't it great last week, our strategic partner, he did such a good job just sharing. He has a great sense of humor, and I hope you have caught the vision to send people to the ends of the earth, people who want to make the name of Jesus known, want to fulfill the Great Commission to go into all the world and make disciples. And so I love that we collectively get to be a part of making that happen as we are faithful in our missions each month. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. All right. Sounds good. I love that you're awake and alive. Let me begin today with a question. Uh, sounds like a generic question, but... Um, do you have a vision for your life? <laughs> You're like, what is this, Pastor Mark? What did, I, what did I come here for? Do you have a vision for your life? I know that <clears throat> that, that can be a tough question to answer. But the reality is, all of us are living out a vision for our life. Every single one of you. You may not have articulated that. It may not be on your mirror or as you're, you know, on your car dashboard as you're driving, like, this is my vision. This is my vision. But you have a vision for your life. And every decision you make, every, every step is in a direction to attain this preferred vision for your life. <clears throat> the problem is many of us, are giving ourselves up for lesser visions, things that don't really matter. So the question I want you to think about in addition to, do I have a vision for my life, is whose vision is it? Where did you pick it up? Some of us have just grabbed someone else's vision or uh, the media or music or songs and movies that they said, this is, this is the good life. This is the life you need to go after. And so you've grabbed a hold of their vision and the last question is, is your vision worthy of your life? Now, that's a really good question, isn't it? Okay. <clears throat> At the moment that things come into clarity, is usually towards the end of our life, right? Looking back, where you can self-evaluate to say, man, was all that effort, all that time, all that money, all that purpose that I spent in my life, is it what I wanted to accomplish? And more specifically, is it what God wanted me to accomplish? Did your life make a difference? So I want you to think about that question kind of as the backdrop as we look at today's text. In fact, today's text focuses strictly on the life of Paul. Um, Luke, who is writing the book of Acts, becomes laser focused like Barnabas um, Apollos, their, their mentions, they're there, there's people present. In fact, we believe that Luke actually traveled with Paul, which is he's writing a firsthand account. So he's on these missions trip, but he focuses strictly on the life of Paul. His journey to Rome, where he will finish out the rest of his life in this text, in prison, testifying to the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, today I'm going to attempt to cover eight chapters so I, I know some of you are like, oh no, I'm so hungry, I'm ready for lunch. <laughs> so there's going to be less scripture reading and more summary, but I want you to see the Holy Spirit in the text and, and the various ways that the Holy Spirit is working in and through the Apostle Paul's life and the people that he encounters. I also want you to see that Paul has a vision for his life, which is why I asked you that question, a vision that drives every decision he makes. He is laser focused on fulfilling the vision. Here's just a couple ways that Paul says this as he's writing to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he says, for when I preach the gospel, I can't boast since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. I love how he says that. I kind of feel that way as a pastor. This is referring to God's call on my life. Paul is referring to the God's call in his life where he says, I have to preach. I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I don't preach. Acts 26, uh, we're not there, but this is just a little snippet. He, he's standing before King Agrippa. He says, so then King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. 
He's like, I was faithful. I walked in obedience every single moment. Uh, as Paul writes to 2 Timothy chapter 4, 6, and 7, he says, For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. Paul's like, I'm at the end of my life. But he said, I've fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He was laser focused on the vision that God had for his life. And so I want to put a focus today on how do you and I get a vision from heaven? If you're here, you're like, Pastor Mark, thank you for not um, asking me to raise my hand or respond, but I don't have a vision for my life. I don't have a vision that I feel good about, that I'm feeling like I'm doing what God has called me to do. And I want to talk about that today. And so I believe that a vision from heaven is going to involve three things. And you're going to see these on the slide um, all together. It's going to involve God's call on your life, his gifts, and his purpose. And they're not like one, two, three. It's like they're all in one. They all work together. But here's what I want you to understand, that each of these is really a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So rather than focus strictly on these, I really want to focus on the work of the Holy Spirit and how those three relate to the Holy Spirit's working. And I hope I haven't lost you at all in that. You're like, what are we talking about today? Okay. Talking about the life of Paul, the vision he had, we're going to reflect on these three things, but I really want you to see how the Holy Spirit is working in and through Paul's life and around him in the circumstances. While the book of Acts, if you have a formal title, it's referred to as Acts of the Apostles. We've just shortened it to Acts. But I think a more appropriate title would be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because it's not about these men. It's not about their incredible faith, though they have incredible faith. But it is truly more about the Holy Spirit at work in and through and around their lives and the believers as a whole for God fulfilling his purpose. We see the Holy Spirit on every single page of our text. Here's Paul's understanding. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, Paul's writing while he's on a missionary journey to the church of Corinth. And here's what he says to them. This is just a snippet, and I encourage you to read this if this is new to you. But beginning of verse 4, he says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. So he's referring to the Holy Spirit, saying the Holy Spirit distributes a lot of different kind of gifts. Verse 5, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone. Say everyone. everyone. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. It is the same God at work. Verse 7, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now, just the way that is written, I just, one quick explanation. That when the Holy Spirit is in your life, His Spirit is manifested in you in certain gifts. So that's all that's saying. So in case you missed that. Verse 8. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So one quick point of clarity, as we've been talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which from Peter and in the text is for every single believer, that's when he endues you with power to be a witness for him. And then there's also the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You may have more than one, but you have at least one. And those are to edify the church, the body of Christ. So that's the distinction. So God's vision for your life can be simplified, and I'm, this is me talking here. Walk in the Spirit. That sounds biblical, doesn't it? Okay? That's what the Bible says, that we walk or we live in the Holy Spirit. So God's call, his giftings, and his purpose for your life all come together as you walk in the Holy Spirit, as you're leaning in 
as you're listening, as you're following, as you're obeying to how the Holy Spirit leads, guides, and prompts us in every moment, in every decision of our lives. So the last few weeks we've been focusing on the Holy Spirit in our lives where we see him in the pages of this text, how he helps us to be more like Jesus. I want to add one little thing because it's so good that remember the goal of the Holy Spirit is to bring glory to Jesus in and through your life. That's his goal. That's his purpose. I love how this is said. Uh, There's a pastor years ago named A.J. Gordon, a well-known pastor from Boston. He was visiting the World's Fair in Chicago. And one of the many exhibits featured a unique watermill. And in the distance, Gordon saw a man robed in bright, gaudy oriental clothes who appeared to be laboriously turning the crank of a pump and thereby making the mighty water flow. Gordon was impressed with the man's energy, his smooth motions, his obvious physical condition. He pumped a tremendous amount of water. But as he drew closer, however, Gordon was surprised that the man was made of wood. That instead of him turning the crank and making the water flow, the flow of water was turning the crank and making him go. And that, my friends is the true nature of the Holy Spirit. We don't make the Holy Spirit flow in our lives, but the Holy Spirit in our lives makes us flow and go, amen? And I love that analogy. This is what it means to walk in the Spirit as you step in, step with God's Spirit and allow Him to lead and guide you and move you in your life. Let me just say off the cuff, this is quite the adventurous life. This is like, you want some excitement in your life, you want some mystery, you want some uh, miraculous things to happen, go ahead and get in step with the Spirit of God in your life and allow Him to lead you. And you're like, you will wake up every morning and say, what's next, Lord? What is next for my life? So the more we study and learn about the Holy Spirit, the more you see Him in the pages of the text. He's everywhere. He's at work Uh, Not only out front, but behind the scenes. He is pushing God's missions forward in this world. So I'm going to go through, in summary, these eight chapters. We'll read some of the text. And I want you to see the Holy Spirit. So last we preached, we were in Acts chapter 19. Paul begins his third missionary journey. And he shows up to Ephesus to a group of 12 men who are believers. And he asks them the question, Have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? If you missed that, you can go back and watch that online at coffeechurch.com. But in chapter 19, verse 21, look, look what Paul says. He says, after all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I've been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. So there is something in Paul's life that he's like, I'm going to Rome. And this is like one of the first places we see this at this moment. But he's got this indication in him that he's got to go to Rome. Now, Rome at this time is the center of the known world of this time in history. And the Holy Spirit puts it in Paul's heart to go to Rome. So that's, he says this out loud, I'm going to Jerusalem, and then I'm going to Rome, okay? So he says it slightly different in the next chapter, chapter 20. And I want to read this in verse 22. He says, and now... Compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Have you ever stopped to say, how does Paul know this? And that's the the key in the text, compelled by the Spirit. There's just something in Paul's spirit, his gut, if you will, that he just knows what's going to happen. Now, how the Holy Spirit tells him and warns him that prison or hardship, we don't know specifically, but from practicality, it's just... He just knows it. And I know that some of you, that makes no sense. You're like, how how do you know something that you don't know? (laughs) 
You just know it. And it's just, I've had this moment in my life too, okay? Uh, but there's, the word compelled is like a gut feeling, an urging to go to a, cert, a certain direction or to do a certain things for God's glory. If you have not experienced that as a Christian, you are missing out because there's been random moments. I, I tell the story way too much. My, my wife is like, don't tell anymore, so I'll just mention it. Like, <laughs> I'm not telling the story. If you haven't heard it and you would like to, just ask me afterwards. But I used to have a mullet way after mullets were long, not cool. Okay, I just, it was my identity. And the Holy, it was like literally the Holy Spirit one day said, cut your hair. And I was like, that was weird. I didn't want to cut my hair. I like my hair. I like my mullet and stuff. But I obeyed. I, I cry. Anyway, that was kind of a, an early indication I was like, it was a thought I had, but I was like, that's not my thought. So I obeyed. And then I understood afterwards. I've had the Holy Spirit drop dollar amounts. Mark, you're going to give this amount. And I'm like, I don't want to give that amount. <laughs> but when you know it's from the Holy Spirit, you obey, right? Places to go. There's times that the Holy Spirit just said, pick up the phone and call. And I picked up the phone and to find they just begin to cry and just go, I can't believe you're calling me, Pastor Mark. You just don't know. I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> I was just, I was supposed to call you. I picked up the phone. I called you. It's obedience. It's a gut feeling. It's, it's a leaning into your spiritual desires and promptings. You just know you need to do something. See, we are people that are led by the spirit or we are spirit led. Amen. He leads us. He guides us. And sometimes you feel a little crazy. I feel prompted right now. It's not in my notes because I, told, I tell this story. And sometimes when missionaries come and you're like, did that really happen? You know, or pastors tell a story like, I heard a story. And they read it on the internet. I've done it. I'm guilty. Because it's a good story and it's true. So sometimes I wonder. So in 2014, I had the opportunity to go on a trip um, to visit Argentina and Brazil. And we were meeting pastors and missionaries and having great conversations. And they were telling a story of a lady. And she was going to commit suicide. And she's, uh, sorry, give me a moment. <laughs> she's going to commit suicide. And she said, God, if you're real, then have somebody come in here and stand on their head by that machine. And sure enough, a young man came in and stood on his head by that machine. Now, how foolish do you think that young man felt when he felt by the Holy Spirit, I want you to go to this restaurant and stand on your head by this machine. <laughs> in fact, he, the story goes, he went and he waited. There was too many people and he was chicken. So he waited till it emptied out as there was just like two or three people. And he did that. And this lady's like, why did you do that? And he's like, oh, no. And he's like, I just felt like God told me to do that. And she begins to cry. She gave her heart to Jesus. And what I love about that is the person telling the story goes, oh, yeah, and she's now overseeing all of our small group discipleship ministries, overseeing 300 people. I'm like, oh, you know this person, right? <laughs> like, I love that. We are led by the Spirit. Acts 21, Paul says, we landed in Tyre where our ship was to unload its cargo. We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But it, when it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. To which I'm like, Paul, were you disobedient at that moment? No, because God had already put in Paul's heart. He says, you're going to Rome, and you're going to testify to me there. So I think it's just good people who love Paul going, don't go. Don't do it, right? And Paul's like, nope, going to go anyway. We call this the gift of prophecy. We read in Corinthians earlier, that's one of the gifts. The gift of prophecy is when someone knows what is going to happen before it happens. I thought about playing like do, 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 do right? Because it, it has that kind of a moment of a feel. But when you put God in, you go, of course, God knows everything, right? He knows what's going to happen. That's not, a, that's not a little thing for him. And so he drops in the heart of people who have the gift of prophecy, who 
share that in a moment. Here's what God is about to do. Here's what is about to happen. Now, sometimes that is just a warning, uh, but it's not always to change the direction. Sometimes it's just a moment. Now, we see this more clearly in Acts chapter 21. So let me read that, beginning at verse 10. Paul says, After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people pleaded with Paul, Don't go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. I love that. And God's will be done. If God's called you to Rome, Paul, then his will be done. Don't let us stop you, but we would like you not to go. (laughs) We would like you to change your mind. Sometimes it's not to change the situation, but I think it gives us confidence to go, well, God told me it was going to happen, and then it happened. So why am I surprised? And why would I freak out? God knows, and he has me there. So he's going to take care of me. Yes, amen. He's going he's to walk me through it. Or... It's the end of your life like Stephen was martyred and you go, I don't understand, but the Lord's will be done. But man, the confidence I think we have, we were, Stacey and I were having just a great conversation with our young adults this past Tuesday and Revelation came up, okay? Like just that good encouraging book of Revelation, right? Which is prophetic writing. All of stuff that is going to happen in the future that has not happened yet. And you're like, it's been 2,000 years. Like, what's going on? The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. A day is like a 1,000 years. A 1,000 years is like a day. God's promises are yes and so be it. It's going to happen. It's been foretold already. And a couple of the young adults were saying, it kind of freaks me out. And I was like, me too. However, God's told us what's going to happen. And it's going to happen. I'm confident of that. So now, knowing it's going to happen, I'm like, at least I can take comfort in knowing God's in control and he's got me wherever I'm going to be. Whether he comes, we talk pre-trib, mid-trib. If you have no idea what I'm referring to, don't worry about it right now, okay? Just, Just focus on Jesus. But it doesn't matter as long as we're ready, amen? Come, Lord Jesus. If he comes today, if he comes in a thousand years, live every day like you're ready. And so just, we take comfort and hope because God says, it's going to get bad, and that's okay. I got you, okay? So hopefully that helps you a little bit, but uh, if not, that's our conversation. So chapters 21 through 26 is really about Paul arriving in Jerusalem. He's arrested, as was prophesied about, and he's standing on trial. So let me go quickly on this one. Chapter 21, verse 27, says, when the seven days were nearly over, as was prophesied about, and he's standing on trial. So let me go quickly on this one. Chapter 21, verse 27. The whole crowd and seized him, shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, yes, you read that correctly. While they were trying to kill Paul, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the riders saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So clearly the Jews hate Paul. He used to be on their side, and he switched sides. He's now for Jesus. He's now for the way, this sect that they refer refer to him as. And they hate him so much, they want him dead. Chapter 2, Paul's like, can I address the crowd? He addresses the crowd. He tells them of his salvation story. Remember Acts chapter 9? Paul's like, I was on my way to Damascus. A bright light shone, knocked me off of my horse. And then I heard Jesus, and I was like, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. Paul's telling this story. 
It's just his story. This is what happened. This is how I came to be a follower of the way. And their response, they still wanted to kill him, right? They just like, they just did, they weren't going to listen. But God had already told Paul that was going to happen. Chapter 23, more than 40 men make a vow not to eat or drink anything until Paul is dead. But then Paul's sister's son happens to overhear these 40 men make this commitment. So he tells Paul, tells the commander, the commander has him sent off to Felix. I call this providential moments. It just so happened that so-and-so heard. It just so happened at right, just at the right moment. Have you had a providential moment happen in your life? That's that moment where you respond, only God, only God, only God could, could do it. Can I just tell you, church, that God knows exactly what you need when you need it? There are times, and I've complained to him many times, where I'm like, God, you are late. You are late. I asked you, and I expected, and this was the right moment. Trust me, God. If you would have did it right then, then I would have really known, and that would have been like, ah, oh, like angels singing. But you missed the moment. You were delayed. But often he's late or delayed because he has a better plan and a better time that speaks in a better way to our circumstance and situation. Amen? So now he's standing before Governor Felix, chapter 24. We have found this man to be a troublemaker there, accusing Paul, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple, so we seized him. By examining him yourself, O Felix, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. Paul makes his defense, verse 11, you can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone in the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God that these men have themselves that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. At the same time, he was, Felix was hoping that Paul would offer him a bride, so he sent for him frequently and talked to him. So let me just make a note that now Felix is meeting regularly with Paul, and there's never, it's just not Paul and Felix, there's like other officers, other people. And Paul just notes how often he gets the opportunity to talk about his God and his Savior, Jesus when two years, verse 27, had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Bummer, right? We move on to chapter 25. Now he's before Festus. Okay, so now he's given his defense again. Paul made his defense. I've done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, asked, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I'm now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I've not done anything wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I'm guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar." After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar, you will go. Guess where Paul's going? Rome. And he gets a free trip there. <laughs> right? Like had he made this trip on his own, he might fear for his life because the Jewish people were trying to kill him. But now he gets under security, Roman guard, free trip to Rome. I love how God... It's providential moments. God just knows what we need when we know it, when we need it. Agrippa, who is a king, visits Festus. He says, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, tomorrow you will hear him. Paul again, for Agrippa gives his defense, shares his testimony again. He, Paul keeps referring back to, here's what 
God has done for my life. But notice again how many people Paul gets to share Jesus with. For several years, Paul's in prison with some freedoms, but he continues time and time again to testify to who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit just continues to open up door after door after door. And Paul's just faithful to walk through that. In fact, that is my summary that I want to leave you with today, is that Paul walked in obedience to God's vision for his life. He walked in obedience. I already read it where he says to Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Wherever he goes and whomever he stands in front of, whether important or not important, whether great or not great, Paul continues to tell people about Jesus. And two things to keep in mind, he uses his testimony to persuade, to say, this is what God has done for me. Do you know that that is not combative or confrontational when you just share, but let me share my story. Let me tell you how I have become a Christian. Let me tell you why I serve this God. It's so simple. And every single one of you have a story and a testimony. And if you're like me, I grew up in church and you're like, what could you have done wrong? Like, I just like, man, I had a drug problem growing up. I was drugged to Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday school. So, I mean, I, right? My parents drug me there all the time. Not quite the same. Just a little bit of humor there for you. But I can testify that at the age of 15, grow, having grown up in church, my anger was off the charts. I wanted nothing to do with God. I hated people. I just, I was insecure. I was mad at, at everyone. There's a couple holes that I gifted my parents' house growing up with and the door and the wall as a gift of my anger. When you think of a vision that God has for your life, many of you think it's a clear plan. You know every step. You're knowing how God's going to get you. And trust me, it's not that way. It's just a whole lot of steps of obedience. A whole lot of moments of leaning in and going, I don't even understand why you're asking me to do that, Holy Spirit, but I'm going to obey. And you take a step of faith. One after the other after the other. So let me come back to that question. You are following a vision for your life. But again, whose vision are you carrying? Do you carry the one that God has for you? And is it worthy of your life? I hope it is. I hope it is. And if there's anything we can take out of this, it's just to wake up and in your insecure, boring, normal self. And I'm talking about me. <laughs> I, wish I, I wish I had more stories. I wish I... Like, just the cool stuff that you would go, wow, look how God's using your life. I don't. It looks a lot like a little bit of obedience here, a little bit of obedience there, showing faithful, going, I, am I doing the right thing, God? I don't know. Sometimes I don't know. And that's okay. Amen? But man, at the end of my life, I want to look back and just go, but I was obedient to your call. I searched out your giftings. God, how have you gifted me, Holy Spirit? How can I leverage that to build up and encourage the church to reach this world for Jesus? I want to live God's purpose for my life. Would you stand to your feet as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your text. I thank you for long chapters about with details on the life of Paul of he went to this city and that city and did this and that and sometimes it's hard to glean out of that but one thing we see the Holy Spirit at work we see the Holy Spirit open up doors of opportunity and God I want that for my life I want that for this church Lord that we're just faithful and obedient in all the little things as we tune our ears we lean in as we are led by the Spirit of God walk in obedience to that vision, Lord. 
Help that be clear in us. Give us that resolve. Give us that compulsion. What is those areas? What are those areas that I'm compelled by the Spirit? I'm compelled. Woe to me if I do not. And you fill in the blanks as the Holy Spirit leads and guides you. So help us today in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen. amen. So good to have you here. I hope you enjoyed today's message. Uh, Would you take a moment, introduce yourself to a few people around you before you head out, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Have a blessed week. 